Zsófia uh, Illés, who will show us a uh, more than multidisciplinary, as uh, so a scientific plus art, uh, art approach of how to design a uh, future which is going beyond human desires and towards sustainability. Certainly a attempt and probably not solving on global scales the problems we discussed all today, but at least a kind of uh, uh, silver horizon on, on that we are, uh, are thinking how to tackle, how to uh, design the future, which is may grow out of uh, virtuality, but also, as we, say, we shall see, it is on a sens uh, sen sensory approach where you have to see and turn the, what you see into reality. Okay, so it works. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm uh, Zsófia Illés, and I feel I come from a quite different area, probably from most of you. I'm a placemaking designer and a researcher um, in land research project, uh, projects by the Moholina University of Design. I'm also a fellow researcher at IESC. Um, as I was introduced, I do research sensory methods into placemaking design, and I'll explain all these um, terms I have been using. What is design? Why design might be interesting in terms of ecological thinking and research? What is placemaking? Um, and what do, do our senses have to do with all of this and art and design? So I will break down all these and I'll be reading from my notes because I haven't had the chance to speak to a live audience in a while. Um, and let's see how it goes. So uh, my contribution to the panel as, as I was introduced will be uh, a design and methodological one um, in order to explore what different kinds of arts and design-based methods can do in relation to global challenges such as climate change. Uh, how these can encourage and enable place-based engagement and collaboration, and how such methods can help designers and researchers to communicate multifaceted complex environmental issues. So what does design do, and what can design do in relation to how we interact with our environments? Uh, this is an example of how our behavior shapes the environment. I think I, I, uh, it's, it's my old slides, I'm sorry. I had a really nice slide about hostile architecture and uh, desire paths uh, that are not here apparently. But I wanted to share a picture about what desire paths are. So that's an example of how our behavior can shape the environment. Desire paths are uh, paths that normally people naturally take at a park and then designers look at it and they will actually choose those desired paths as uh, pedestrian walkways later on. So that's a way how we shape our environment. We choose what will, what will those paths be for us. Another way I wanted to share with you, but the slide is also missing, is uh, hostile architecture. So that's, uh, that's a bad example of uh, how humans can shape the environment and how the environment in... Um, reaction to that also shapes how we behave in, in there. So hostile architecture is when uh, urbanists, for example, place out in the urban um, uh, public areas uh, benches that might have spikes on it or trees where there are spikes or window sills with spikes so pigeons wouldn't sit on the win window sills or homeless people wouldn't use benches for sleeping. So that's an example of hostile architecture when the environment that we design will shape our behavior within the environment. Um, and um, so this here is, is what I wanted to talk about uh, to define what placemaking design does and what placemaking does. Um, as it's defined by Kelker and, and Spinelli, 
It's the interplay of needs and aspirations of the community enacted in the design of the environment. These are two images to illustrate this, two of my previous project examples, when diverse communities were involved in decision-making about land use, uh, urban land use uh, in the left, on the left side, and it was about uh, land, future land use in Scotland on the right side. On the left side, diverse communities were involved in London uh, to decide about how public green space it could support their mental health. And on the right hand side, children were participating in, in making and helping shape uh, the future land use policies of, of Scotland. So placemaking, what placemaking does, it involves diverse communities. And as designers, we are trying to find those right tools for that kind of involvement. What tools would speak to the audiences that we want to involve? So essentially, this is participatory research and choosing the methods for that. And these methods essentially all stem from human-centered design. That has been the most predominant design perspective for the past 30 years at least, with disciplines stemming from it such as service design, interaction design, user experience research, all to encompass complex processes, services, and, and social systems. A good example of human-centered design is social design that places social issues at the center of the design process and involves those experiencing these in participatory process. On the left side, it's a, an example from Hungary, Miskolc, Markraft Social Workshop, um, where they do work with uh, young people um, on the autism spectrum disorder. And on the right side, it's Phytology Medicine Garden and Mobile Apothecary from London, uh, where they actually, it's, it's basically a community herbal garden and they support uh, people in need from the area with herbal medicine. So these are, for me, good examples of, of what social design can do. And then an example of what happens when design goes wrong uh, with humans in the center of it again um, and excludes certain publics is, is hostile design, as I mentioned before. So spiky benches to prevent uh, um, homeless people from sleeping there and uh, spiky trees that would prevent pigeons, for example, using the trees, their green infrastructure, basically. Not nice. Um, But where I wanted to get with all this is a provocation that I wish, wish to offer here. Um, we see that the start of human-centered design is dated back to around 1958, to the founding of the Stanford University Design Program. And various dates uh, for the Anthropocene Epoch have also been proposed. Recently, the 1960s is one theory. And this actually correlates with the start of human-centered design. We cannot argue that uh, human-induced changes got us here, so the provocation I'm offering from a design perspective is that we might need a paradigm shift to decenter the human in the design process. If the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail, states the theory of law of instrument by Abraham Maslow. To decenter the human perspective, therefore, we will also need new methods and new tools that allow for understanding the versatility of diverse viewpoints, multiscalar and multilayered complexities, and allow for considering different timescales rather than only the human one. And here my presentation connects with the original question of emerging ecologies. Yes, and I propose that participatory and sensory art and design methods could be alternative tools in empathizing with other perspectives and imagining future scenarios. This image is an example of a project that we did in this region of the Lake Balaton in um, Balaton Upland region during the autumn. Uh, sensory and artistic approaches were used here to help local farmers and stakeholders 
imagine the climate future of the region 10 years from now. I will talk more about this project later on. Such sensory methods that the previous project was also using are rooted in sensory ethnography. This perspective is interdisciplinary in that it also draws from theoretical approaches um, developed in human um, and cultural geography. And the principles of sensory ethnography include sensory perception, knowing, memory, and imagination. And imagination is an important one for us to imagine possible futures. This approach promises to bring to the fore tacit, normally unspoken about ways of knowing and doing that are also part of how we feel and sense our futures. This image above is a sensory map uh, from a placemaking project that I did with a migrant woman in Glasgow in one of the most diverse neighborhoods of Glasgow in, in Govan Hill in 2020, um, where there is the highest concentration of vacant and derelict land affecting communities living around that area um, and stigmatizing people living in that neighborhood. So this map was one of the results of a set of uh, participatory mapping walks to help understand how these spaces affected the well-being of uh, migrant women living in the area. And it was a set of workshops and a set of walks, uh, concluding with the last one that was um, to imagine possible future scenarios, future imagining, basically. The same approaches can also be well used in imagining ecological futures. They can help participants and stakeholders to empathize with more than human perspectives or imagine future scenarios, um, or make sense of phenomena that may otherwise easily escape the human sensorium, like the Anthropocene, or the climate crisis that is um, very difficult to understand. Processes happening on different timescales on a global level and they might easily escape the human sensorium, so it's not the easiest for us to make sense of such phenomena. Attending to the sensory experience can give us access to other scales and temporalities that we humans cannot otherwise easily comprehend. Where the process is involved, the long duration of geological time easily escapes the human sensorium. By bringing these phenomena somehow into our human experience through sensing, it can also help us better relate. So that instead of such removed visual representations um, that are quite removed from our immediate reality, our visual references might also change, perhaps become something more close to our daily experience. I brought uh, one example for this. Um, this is the Balaton Uplands project I previously mentioned, an artistic design research project done with the MoMA University in collaboration with ecologist uh, Ferenc Jordan, farmers and our students from MoMA to explore the near future uh, landscape and the ecology of the Balaton Uplands 10 years from now in order to help the pre-adaptation of farmers working in this region. Through scientific data, and based on interviews with local farmers, we have developed a landscape network model of this area 10 years from now. So the current one is on the left and the future one is on the right. That included species that are already appearing and with the changing climate in the changing landscape, such as uh, pomegranates, olives, uh, pistachios. I know this sounds crazy, but it's actually already in the landscape. Um, with our students, we created a future landscape through food, sound, and video, and our stakeholders and participants were invited into this sensory future landscape to think together, argue, and discuss what they have found realistic and how they might try to adapt. I will end my contribution to the panel by concluding that experiential art and design methods can be well used in participatory projects and research to enable diverse engagement and collaboration. They can be good tools of scientific knowledge transfer by communicating complexities and new insights. And sensory methods can help 
imagine alternative and possible future scenarios, and provide alternative perspectives. These methods will be further discussed and explained through more examples uh, during the Wednesday morning seminar. And thank you very much for your attention.